Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and the first video of 2020. I had a really nice couple of weeks off for the holidays and hope you all did as well, but now I'm itching to get back to drawing and painting again. In today's video I'm going to be doing a wolf portrait using soft pastel sticks and pastel pencils, and I'll list all of my materials in the description box along with a reference photo from Pixabay if you want to go and check them out. I'm going to talk you through my techniques today, as well as give you a few of the pros and cons of using either pastels in sticks or pencils, so hopefully it'll be helpful if you've ever considered trying pastels out and haven't been sure which would suit you better. Being the start of a new year, I also want to recap on my 2019 art goals, as well as mention a few new ones I have for 2020, and I'll be doing that a bit later on in the video, so I hope you enjoy it. I'd actually drawn the outline for this piece over a year ago now, using a white charcoal pencil on Canson China Grey Me Tense paper, and I didn't get much further than that, but a comment I got in response to one of my recent videos reminded me of it and I was inspired to get it back out and finish it off. So with the outline already done, I decided to first fill in the background, and because it's quite a large area, I chose a pastel stick as it's a lot quicker and easier than using a pencil. This one is from Faber-Castell student range in the colour sky blue. I use the stick flat on its side with a circular motion to cover as much of the surface and tooth of the paper as I can. I haven't done many pastel drawings on this channel so far, but working with pastels is very similar to working with charcoal, and I talked about that when I drew Monet in a recent video, and I'll leave a link to that at the end of this video if you haven't seen it and fancy giving it a watch. Pastels and charcoal can be thought of as very messy to work with, but if you work from left to right and top to bottom, then you'll minimise any of the pastels spreading onto unwanted areas or transferring onto your arm or clothes. With the first layer of pastel down, it's now time to blend, and you can use a variety of tools for this. If you don't much like getting your hands dirty, then you can use a paper stump like I'm using here, or a tissue, or whatever you've got available. The paper stumps are good though for getting around smaller, more detailed areas, but if you don't have one of these, you can use a cotton bud or q-tip instead. As you can see though, using the paper stump here has created quite a lot of dust, so if you don't mind getting your fingers dirty, then provided your hands are clean and grease free, I personally don't have a problem with using this method for blending charcoal and pastels, and actually think it's better at smoothing the pastel into the tooth of the paper than some of the other methods. You can also see that all the dust that was present at the start has been worked into the paper, which means less waste and less chance of that dust getting into the air and being inhaled. The coverage of the first layer was okay, but for my second layer I switched over to a softer, more creamy pastel stick. This one is from Unison, which is a more expensive artist grade stick, but the coverage is a lot better and they remind me a bit of pan pastels if you've ever seen or tried those. I used the same method to apply the pastel as before though, using my finger to smooth the pastel into the paper. For the bottom half of the drawing I used a slightly lighter colour, and blended it together with the darker colour on the surface of the paper to get a blurry background effect. These pastel sticks are great for this and anywhere you need to cover larger areas or areas without small details. Finally, I use my lightest shade of blue to add in some snow. I blended some of the larger snowflakes out using my finger again, and dotted in some smaller and more defined snowflakes to add variety and interest. With 
With the background done, I moved on to the wolf, and for this more detailed area, I switched over to using my pastel pencils. You can use the pastel sticks to block out the main colours or sections first, but being that I wanted to build a realistic fur texture using several layers, I opted for the accuracy and control of the pencils. I started at the top of the drawing with a white pastel pencil to mark out the snow on the wolf's head. Working on this grey paper gives me a mid-tone colour right from the start, around which I can then more easily fill in the lightest lights and the darkest darks to ensure I get a good range of values. At this stage I'm just blocking in some snowy shapes and using the reference photo as a guide. I'm not worrying about copying every flake of snow and I'll add more detail in later. Now I'm marking in some of the darkest areas using dark grey, so that's the area at the top where the ear is, the eye and the wolf's nose. The advantage to using the pencils over the sticks here is that you can better see and control what you're doing, and can even sharpen the pencils to a point for small detailed areas. The pencils I'm using today are the Stabilo Carbothello pastels, which I think are really reasonably priced, neither too hard nor too soft, and come with a good range of colours in this set of 60. For sharpening, I use either a sandpaper block or the plastic handheld sharpener that came in the set. For the dark fur around the mouth where the whiskers will be, I make sure that I'm following the direction of fur growth, even at this early stage in the drawing. Next, I start to build up the darker fur by the wolf's ear using shades of brown and grey, and again paying close attention to the fur length and direction from the reference picture and trying to replicate that in my drawing. When working with pastels, and especially when trying to render fur texture, it's all about the layers, and that's one of the things that I really love about pastels, their ability to layer. Unlike working with other mediums, you also have the freedom and flexibility to layer dark colours over light ones, but also light colours over dark ones too, making pastels great for beginners and more experienced artists alike. You can also cover a lot of ground quite quickly as well, which is great if you don't have a lot of free time or patience, so they are definitely worth trying out if you get the chance. Obviously, how many layers you can apply does largely depend on the type of paper you are using. You need to use a paper with a bit of texture to it to grab onto the pastel and keep it there, so it's worth researching which paper will suit you, your budget and your individual needs before you buy. My favourite pastel paper at the moment is the pastel matte paper or board by Claire Fontaine, as it's more like a fine sandpaper. It allows multiple layers without any problem, but it can take a bit of getting used to. Let me know in the comments which is your favourite pastel paper if you have one. So my usual method for applying my layers is to lay down the pastel first, then blend before applying the next layer. The blending in between layers both helps to cover the tooth of the paper and help the pastel to adhere to the paper before applying the next one. That's not to say you have to press down hard on your paper, but it does help to smooth and even things out and prevent the build up of dust. You'll also notice me wiping off my blending stumps on the piece of scrap paper under my hand and this is to make sure I don't spread or mix darker colours into lighter areas. You can also use a sandpaper block for this. So now, whilst I continue to build up those layers for the wolf's fur, working a section at a time, I'm going to quickly recap on a few of the art goals I had for 2019, and give you some of the new goals I have for 2020. Last year, I was all about wanting to try new things, and I'll put a link to the video I posted if you want to see it, but I'll warn you it's a bit cringy as I'm really not comfortable being on camera. I wanted to paint portraits and landscapes, post more regularly, and upload some real-time videos. 
I mentioned collaborations and even painting with oils for the first time, and I also had my own goals for channel growth and so on. So how did I do? Well, I think I did okay looking back. I did at least start the year uploading twice weekly to YouTube, but I had to drop back to once a week again after about six months due to various commitments preventing me from carrying that schedule on. I'd like to say I'll upload more frequently again this year, but with the possibility of a new job on the horizon, I can't commit to that as yet. So for the time being, I'm going to be sticking with one video per week and working on quality rather than quantity. So far as collaborations go, I did several, including a really fun collaboration with Amy from Amy Howard Art, which I really enjoyed, and the collaborations with Dina Tollefson, where I entered several of her art challenges, which were kind of collaborations. So far as trying new things, I was also lucky enough to be sent a few freebies to try out and review, namely the watercolour painting books from Inspiria.com and the watercolour art supplies from Arteza. I love trying out new art supplies, so I was really excited and happy to do these, and I hope to be able to do more art supply reviews this year as well. I mentioned in my art inspiration video before the holidays that I'm going to be keeping a notebook of all the video ideas I have for this year, and I've included a section for new art supplies I'd like to test as well. I've also got separate pages for video ideas that I've had, along with video ideas from you guys, so that's something I've already started and will continue to add to throughout the year, or whenever an idea comes up. So if you have any new ideas for videos or art supply reviews that you'd like to see here on my channel, then please drop me a message in the comments box and I'll add it to the list. If you've already put forward a suggestion previously and I haven't done a video on it yet, then chances are it's in the book as I transferred them all over from last year's diary. But if you have a minute, just jot it down in the comments box again for me, just to be doubly sure. So one thing I didn't get round to doing this year was trying out oil paints, but I did get to do a few acrylic paintings instead, the first with Amy and then a couple of others since. I think I've got to know this medium a bit better through doing these few paintings, but there is still a lot to learn, and that's why one of my goals this year is to improve my acrylic painting skills and complete at least another four pieces. I also only attempted one real-time video where I tried to talk along whilst painting. In theory, this was going to save time recording voiceovers and cut down on time spent editing, but in reality I found it difficult to talk and paint at the same time. This meant the overall quality of the video was a bit up for debate, so I didn't try it again. I also tend to paint quite slowly when I'm filming for YouTube, so nothing was really working in my favour. A few of you though have asked that I make longer videos, so maybe there's a way to bring both of these things together this year. I'd love to know by the way what you think the perfect video length would be, so let me know your thoughts on that. Okay, so there were also a couple of other achievements that I was really happy about and didn't mention in last year's goals video, and that was completing October for the third year running, and of course being offered a permanent post as an artist for the Animal Artist Collective. I'm not sure how I feel about doing Inktober again this year, as it's pretty tough going, and I have a suspicion that people might be getting a bit tired of watching the same sort of videos by the end of the month. I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one. As for the Animal Artist Collective, I am really looking forward to what 2020 may bring, and I've already got something exciting underway for our first video at the end of this month. It's been fantastic to be part of such a great group of like-minded artists who raise money and awareness for animal welfare and conservation all over the world. So that pretty much covers what I mentioned for my goals last year, but what's new for 2020? Well, I would of course like to carry on growing my channel and I'm going to try and do that in a few different ways. Firstly, by being more active on social media and secondly, by making sure I'm posting the sort of content that you guys want to watch and presenting it to you the best way I can. I've had to learn a lot pretty fast about editing using Premiere Pro this year and plan on watching more tutorials to hopefully learn new things and get me to be a bit more efficient in my video production. I'd also like to have a bit of a shake up in my Etsy shop as well to help boost my sales there and I've got a few ideas on what to do for that which I'm going to be implementing hopefully over the next couple of weeks. 
That all being said, I think one of my main goals this year is to be kinder to myself, get more sleep and try not to put myself under unnecessary stress and pressure, as it's not good for your health and ends up having a negative effect on productivity. I want to be more organised too and prioritise more effectively with the aim of having more fun with art, whether it be trying new products, new styles, new mediums or simply experimenting with new ideas, both on and off camera. There are other things I would like to achieve, of course, like build up a website for example, but I think if I overload myself with too many goals at once, it gets a bit overwhelming and I end up feeling bogged down before I start. Besides, different people set goals in different ways. Some people like to set big, ambitious, long-term goals, like say a one-year or five-year plan, whilst others prefer smaller, more manageable goals each week or each month. It depends on what works best for you. Right now, I like the idea of smaller, realistic, short-term goals, and then anything else that happens is a bonus. But let me know in the comments how you like to set your goals, as I'd be really interested to know. I think the goals that I've set so far will keep me busy for a while. So now I'm going to go back to the wolf drawing again, where having blocked in the main sections of fur, I look at the portrait as a whole and correct some of the colours and values and try to tie the whole piece all together. I do this by adding a sort of glaze using the pastel pencils again. I hold my pencil right at the end and apply really light pressure using the side of the pastel. This ensures I don't disturb the fur detail I've already put in, but it helps to add a bit more depth. This technique works well with the pencils, but I wouldn't advise it with the softer, more creamy pastel sticks, as they'd most likely cover up the details underneath. I work on the area around the wolf's mouth, adding in a bit more brown and a pinky red, as well as some darker greys to give the muzzle area more shape and form. Then it's back to my blending stump again to sort out the snow on the wolf's head. I really wasn't very happy with it as I felt it looked more like a brain than snow, so I tried to smooth it out and added in some more white to help brighten it up. Then I went in with a sharp black pencil to add contrast and some fine hair detail where the wolf's fur was sticking up through the clumps of snow. Now you may have noticed that I've left colouring in the wolf's eye till the very end and the reason for this is simply that I couldn't decide what colour to go with. The reference photo I was working from I think had been photoshopped as it showed the eye as a really bright emerald green. But whilst wolves' eye colour can vary and range between amber brown and gold, they can also come in hues of brown, grey, yellow and green, and I learned as well that wolves are usually born with deep blue eyes, which lighten and change as they mature. I didn't want to copy the photoshopped picture exactly, so originally decided to go for a more natural looking yellow eye, with touches of green and blue around the outside edge of the iris. I left it at that for a bit whilst I added in more detail and definition to the nose using a sharp black pencil, but I wasn't totally convinced. I also added in some light flyaway hairs using the white pencil again. And then drew in the dark whiskers, again using the sharp black pastel pencil, which is something I wouldn't be able to do easily with a soft pastel stick as you don't get the same precision. But the pastel sticks being softer and super pigmented are great for laying down a lot of rich colour easily, and I've gone back to them here to brighten up some of the snowflakes and dot in a few more.
With this all done, I decided to make a last minute change to that eye and make it more blue, which is easy enough with pastels as you can either lift up the pastel with a kneaded eraser or simply add another layer over the top, which is what I did. And I like the blue eye better as it ties in with a blue gray background and is a bit different. With that, this wolf drawing was complete and all I had to do was peel off the washi tape to reveal a nice crisp edge. I will also have to apply a fixative spray to this and the one I use will be listed in the description box if you're interested. I had a lot of fun with this drawing as I really like the flexibility and variety of textures you can get with both pastel pencils and pastel sticks and I hope you enjoyed watching the drawing process and maybe even learned something new. I'd like to thank you all for watching and of course for all the support you've given me over the last year through your comments, likes and subscribes. And I hope you'll join me again next week where I'll be getting my paints back out again. If you don't want to miss it then hit the bell icon and you'll be notified as soon as I upload. Take care, have a great weekend and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye!